Hollywood's Open House. Taken from the pages of the nation's foremost screen publication, Motion Picture Magazine. Starring Enrique Madrigara, his violin, and his orchestra, with radio's newest singing stars, Patricia Gilmore and Harry Cool, an all-star supporting cast, and yours truly, Jim Amici. And our very extra special guest, Miss Ruth Chatterton. think of Hollywood, we think of flashing figures whirling in a gay dance, color, music, and lovely ladies. Well, just to prove that Hollywood's open house is no different than Hollywood itself, our star maestro, Enrique Madriguer, brings us in his own arrangement of Dance with a Dolly with blonde, beauteous Patricia Gilmore joining in for the vocals. Walking down the street, down the street, down the street. I met somebody who was mighty sweet, mighty fair to see. I asked her, would she like to have a talk, have a talk, make some talk. All the fellas standing on the walk, wishing they were me. Mama, mama, let me dress up tonight, dress up tonight, dress up tonight. I've got a secret, gonna dress up tonight, gonna dance by the light of the moon. Gonna dance with the dolly, with the hoon. In the stocking while the knees keep a knocking and the toes keep a rocking. Dance with the dolly with the hole in the stocking. Dance by the light of the moon. Mama, mama, put the cat out tonight. Cat out tonight. Cat out tonight. Works all day. I'm gonna scat out tonight and I won't be home until dawn. So I'm a dance with the dolly with the hole in the stocking while the knees keep a knocking and the toes keep a rocking. Dance with the dolly with the hole in the stocking. Dance by the light of the she got more kisses than a candy store, a candy store, a candy store. Sweeter than I've ever had before. Still I keep crying for more. So I'm a dance with the dolly with the hole in the stocking. Knees keep a knocking, toes keep a rocking. Dance with the dolly with the hole in the stocking. Dance by the light of the moon. Gonna dance by the light of the moon. Gonna dance by the light of the moon. By the light. so strange nor so thrilling as that about to enter now. For our memory movie, chosen by the editors of Motion Picture Magazine, is none other than one of the most original, startling stories ever told. Robert Louis Stevenson's classic of horror, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It was one of the greatest films ever produced in Hollywood, and we now present it in our own radio version, taken directly from the story itself. Our story opens in a deserted street late one black winter night. Under the dim light of a street lamp, a shadowy, misshapen figure of a man can be seen furtively sneaking down the street. 
Suddenly, a little girl about ten years old races out of a cross street and runs right into the man. <laughs> you brat! Can't you see where you're going? Tell yourself, ma'am. You want to help the police catch this man, don't you? Oh, yes, sir, of course. But it was so terrible. I saw him trample my little girl. Well, can you tell us what he looked like? He was horrible. Majestic to look at him. Yeah. Can you be more specific? Well, he, he was short and all out of shape. He was the picture of evil, I tell you. He was a monster. A monster. <laughs> Beg your pardon, sir. What? Well, 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 what do you want? Why, why, I only wanted to inquire the way to... Yeah. Why, why do you look at me so? Go away. Go. Yeah. Oh. Down, down, down. <laughs> Please. One moment, please. One moment. Oh, why, Mr. Utterson, sir. Whatever is wrong? Dr. Jekyll in pool. I must see him at once. Well, I believe so, sir. So far as I know, he's been working in the laboratory all evening. I wouldn't want to disturb him. I must him see him. I... Don't bother to announce me. I'll just go on in. Oh, very well, sir. Who's there? It's me, Utterson. I must see you. Well, I'm... I'm very busy. Henry, it's essential that I see you at once. Very well, Come in. Henry, I'm sorry to come breaking in at this hour of the night. But something's happened you must know about. Oh, really? What's that? Henry, I've spoken to you before about this fellow, Edward Hyde. Oh, my dear chap, you're going off about my will again. Really, we've discussed all that before, and Henry, I... I've been your lawyer for a long time. I've been your friend even longer. A year ago, you made out your will, leaving everything to this Edward Hyde. You know I never approved of it. Well? Well, I'll tell you so again. I've been learning something of this Edward Hyde, Henry. You... What have you learned? That he's black-hearted, evil, dangerous, and a murderer. Well, I, I don't understand. Every night for a week an outrage has been committed by Edward Hyde. And tonight, Sir Danvers Carew was murdered in cold blood by Edward Hyde. Well, how do you know it was Hyde? A maid servant in a nearby house witnessed the crime and recognized Hyde as the assailant. He's seen him before. The police are looking for him, then? They're combing the city. Now, Henry, I don't know what power this monster has over you, but you must take him off. Now tell me what it is, and together we'll invent a plan to get rid of him once and for all. No, Utterson. It's not a question of Hyde having any strange power over me. The moment I choose, I can be rid of Mr. Hyde. And now is the time. I swear to you, Utterson, that I'm done with him now. Mark my words, Mr. Hyde will never be heard of again. <laughs> Lanyon, it's good to be with old friends to talk and laugh like this. Uh, Utterson, yes? I'm afraid this is a time when I must impose a bit on our old friendship. So? How's that? Well, uh, I, I must ask you to, to leave me to myself. I expect a visitor. A visitor whose identity I don't even know. It's only fair to tell you that uh, it involves Dr. Jekyll. Jekyll? Yes. I had a note from him earlier tonight. It came by messenger. I'm sure I don't know what to make of it, and I'm not 
sure I like her. Well, come, Landon, you and Jack will have differences of opinion when it comes to medicine and science, but to our friend... Oh, Jack is a fool. With his newfangled scientific notions and his experiments, he's not a doctor. He's a superstitious charlatan. But I've done as he requested. Well, just what was it he requested? That I bring from his laboratory a certain bunch of chemicals and have them here tonight. Someone's going to call for them. It, it, it makes no sense, Otto. Jekyll's in trouble of some kind, Lanyon. We must do as he asks and try to help him as best we can. Oh, that must be my visitor. He, uh, he was very particular that no one else could see him. I'll step up the side door. Oh, poor Jekyll. If he'd only confide in us, we could do more. Well, good night, Lanyon. Uh, good night, Otto. Good night, Uh, are you the messenger from Dr. Jekyll? Eh. Uh, come in. Come in, then. What is your name? My name doesn't matter. Do you uh, have them? The chemicals. Do you have them? Yes, yes, I have. Well, give them to me. Quick, quick. Give them to me. Uh, there they are on the table. Yes. Yes, they're all here. Good. Good. Huh. Have you got a glass? Over on the sideboard. Good. Good. What? What are you doing? Idiot! Can't you see? I'm mixing these chemicals. There. Well, well, Dr. Lanyon, you look curious. You want to see what happens now. Naturally, naturally. Lanyon. For years, you've refused to recognize superior powers to your own. You've remained in the narrow pathways of the world about you, believing only, only that which you could see and refusing to credit the existence of that which you could not see or touch. Now you may witness the degree of your stupidity. Behold, you see before you, Mr. Hyde, the glass. Chemical. Watch. Watch carefully. Mr. Hyde drinks from the glass. Behold, Lanyon, Dr. Jekyll, no longer Mr. Hyde. In just a moment, we will continue with the second act of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And now, the second act of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Dr. Lanyon, friend of Dr. Jekyll, has, with unbelieving eyes, just witnessed the transformation of the evil Mr. Hyde into the kindly Dr. Jekyll. Lanyon is horrified, repulsed, yet still curious. It, it's incredible, impossible. Impossible? No, Lanyon. You, who've always believed what your eyes saw, must believe them now. But how? What does it all mean? That the double being all of us feel within ourselves, the good and the evil can be separated, can have actual independent existence. It means that I proved my medical theories were right. But, Lanyon, in only one thing have I been wrong. I counted on eliminating the evil and leaving only the good. But instead, I've done the reverse. People have been right when they say Mr. Hyde is evil. He's pure evil. Jekyll, why do you continue this game? Why do you let this, this Hyde exist? Oh, that's the tragedy, Lanyon. He exists in spite of me. In the beginning, I was compelled to drink the drug I had discovered to create Mr. Hyde. Now he comes unbidden. Oh, Lanyon. I go to sleep in my bed as Dr. Jekyll and I waken as Mr. Hyde. It's the evil triumphing over the good in me. I never know when it'll... When it'll... When... Jack, 
Jekyll. Jekyll. <laughs> Dr. Jekyll. God. May I serve you? Get out. Get out, whoever you are. Or whatever you are. I tried to help a friend. And I have helped create a fiend. Go. Go before the wrath of heaven descends on the both of us. For your transgression and your miserable sin. <laughs> Something amiss with Dr. Jekyll. Fool. The fight's a ghost, man. Is the doctor ill? Oh, please, sir. There's no time to lose. Oh, very well, I'm with you. Now, what is it, fool? Oh, someone's shut up in Dr. Jekyll's laboratory, sir. He says he's Dr. Jekyll. Well? There's something strange about it, sir. I I can't say quite what. But I, I want you to come to the house and see what you can discover. Fool. You don't think it's Dr. Jekyll who's in the laboratory? I do not, sir. You think it... I it, don't dare do anything to Mr. Utterson. Who? Could it be Mr. Hyde in there? I'm certain of it. I'm certain this monster, Hyde, has murdered Dr. Jekyll and is staying there inside the laboratory. Oh, but here we are, sir. What now? Fool, we must get into that laboratory. Exactly, Mr. Utterson. You and I will do it. I have everything prepared right here. We'll break the door if he won't open up. Now stand ready, fool. I'll try once to get him to see me. Jekyll, this is Utterson. I demand to see you. Whoever you are in there, you don't come out at once, we shall break down the door. Oh, that's not Jekyll's voice. It's high. Down with the door, man. At him, fool. Hold on to him. Oh, Mr. Utterson. He's, he's hurt. His head, it hit the corner of the table. Oh, what shall we do, sir? There's nothing to do, fool. He's dying. But Dr. Jekyll, sir, where is he? <laughs> Mr. Utterson! Mr. Utterson! Quiet, fool. Control yourself, man. Utterson. Now you know the power of hide over Jekyll. Now... You know, I've sinned, Utterson, but I've suffered. I've trod upon ground forbidden to the human soul and the human mind. The evil will of Hyde has triumphed over whatever goodness there was in Jekyll. Only this I ask, Utterson. Remember, Dr. Jekyll. Forget forever... Mr. Hyde. Fool. This evening, you and I have had a dreadful nightmare. When one has a nightmare, it is wise to never speak of it to anyone and to attempt to forget it oneself. I understand, sir. You are quite right. <laughs> Only one thing that's been missed so far on our Hollywood's open house, and that's romance. Now, what's Hollywood without romance? So we hasten to remedy the situation with the aid of Henrik Madriguer. Senor Madriguer beckons to one of the most romantic of all singers, Harry Cool, and together they bring us I'll Be Seeing You. The children's carousel, the 
chestnut trees The wishing well I'll be seeing you In every lovely summer's day In everything that's light and gay I'll always think of you that way I'll find you in the morning sun And when the night is noon I'll be looking at the moon But I'll be seeing Hollywood has given us many personalities who are associated in our minds with charm and with talent. But it's given us few indeed who are representative of all that's fine and good in the art of motion pictures. We're greatly privileged to have as the honored guest of Hollywood's open house the most beloved and best remembered of these few. May I present with pride and affection Miss Ruth Chatterton. thousand welcomes to Hollywood's Open House, Miss Chatterton. Thank you, Mr. Ritchie. You know, Miss Chatterton, if uh, I'm a bit nervous, it's only because I don't meet and talk with the first lady of the screen every day. Uh, Mr. Ritchie, do you think you really must put it that way? Well, nevertheless, it's true. And, Miss Chatterton, I know that all the books on etiquette say that we as hosts should entertain you because you're our guest. But I want to turn the tables. Really? How do you do that? Well, I want you to entertain us. Now, would you... Do a scene for us, anything you like. Well, I'd be delighted. What would you say to a little scene from Pygmalion? Oh, that sounds swell. Uh, Why do you choose Pygmalion? Well, three reasons. First, I consider it one of the very best comedies ever written. Second, because I played it throughout the country and it's my very favorite role. And third, because I think it's proper that we should do something that has been made into a motion picture. Three fine reasons. Hollywood's Open House presents Miss Ruth Chatterton in a scene from George Bernard Shaw's comedy Pygmalion with Miss Chatterton in the role of Liza. Liza was a flower girl. She sold flowers on the street corners of London, and Liza was not a snob. Henry Higgins was a professor. He sold the ability to speak fine English to the rich who had been poor, and Henry Higgins was just a bit of a snob. Well, what is it, Mrs. Sears? Please, Mr. Higgins, there's a young woman to see you. A young woman, eh? Well, bring her in. Don't stand there, girl. Come in. Well, young woman, what do you want? Don't be so saucy. Did you tell him I come in a taxi? Nonsense, girl. Are we all proud? When I ain't come here to ask for no compliments, and if my money's not good enough, I can go somewhere else. Good enough for what? Good enough for you. I'm come to have lessons, I am, and to pay for them, too. Make no mistake. Well, Mrs. Pierce, shall we ask this baggage to sit down, or shall we throw her out of the window? Ow! Oh. What is it you want, me girl? I want to be lady in the flower shop, but they won't let me unless I can talk more genteel. I heard he could teach me. What's your name? Martha Doolittle. A lady friend of mine gets French lessons from a real French gentleman for 18 cents an hour. Oh. You wouldn't have the face to ask me the same to teach me the old language as you would for French. So I won't give more than a shilling. Take it or leave it. <laughs> it's almost irresistible. She's so deliciously low, so horribly dirty. Oh, I ain't dirty. I wash my face and hands before I come, I did. Mrs. Pierce, I'll do it. I'll make a duchess out of this draggle-tailed gutter snipe. How? Yes, in six months. I'll take her anywhere and pass her off as anything. Well, here we are, Liza. Now remember, 
This is my mother's house. I've taught you how to speak properly, and remember you're to keep on two subjects only. The weather and everybody's health. Now, come along. Henry, I'm so pleased you could come. Oh, Mother, may I present Miss Doolittle? How do you do, my dear? How do you do, Mrs. Higgins? Mr. Higgins said I might come. Well, I'm very glad to see you. Uh, this is Mrs. Einford Hill. How do you do? This is Miss Einford Hill. How do you do? And Mr. Freddie Hill. How do you do? Uh, uh, will it rain, do you think? Uh, the shallow depression in the west of these islands is likely to move slowly in any silly direction. But there are no indications of any great change in the barometrical situation. Ha, ha, ha. How awful is that, eh? What's wrong with that young man? I bet I got it right. Uh, I'm surely, I hope it won't turn cold. There's so much influenza about. My aunt died of influenza. So they said. But it's my belief they've done the old woman in. <laughs> Done her in? Yes, Lord love you. She come through this area like enough the year before. I saw her with my own eyes. They all thought she was dead. But my father, he kept ladling gin down her throat till she came to so sudden she bit the bowl off the spoon. Dear me. What call would a woman with that strength in her have to die of influenza? What's become of her new straw hat that should have come to me? Somebody pinched it. And what I say is, then has pinched it, done her in. You surely don't believe that your aunt was killed. Do I not? Them she lived with would have killed her for a hat pin, let alone a hat. But it can't have been right for your father to pour spirits down her throat like that. It might have killed her. Not her. Jim was mother's milk to her. Uh, besides... He poured so much down his own throat that he knew the good of it. Do you mean he drank? My word. Something chronic. <laughs> <laughs> what are you sniggering at? The new small talk. You, you do it so awfully well, you know. If I was doing it proper, what was you laughing at? Have I said anything I often... Oh, not at all, Liza. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, oh, well, well, I must go. Uh, so pleased to have met you. Goodbye, Miss Ian. Did you? Uh, goodbye, all. I say, um, are you walking across the park, Miss Doolittle? If so... Walk? Not bloody likely. I'm going home in a taxi. Patricia Gilmore, and Harry Cool. The cast included Sylvia Lee, Horace Brand, Rock Rogers, Zoe Van Ruten, and Lamport Hill. My guest star was Miss Ruth Chatterton. The script and all radio adaptations were written by Lee Shane, with music by Jack Velasco. The program was produced under the direction of Ray Green. This is Jim Amici inviting you to Hollywood's open house at the same time next week.